today is, does Ireland have a future? Of course it has a future, but what we want to know is what kind of future Ireland is going to have at this time of um, economic catastrophe. If you look at Irish history, modern Irish history, over the last century, that question, does Ireland have a future, keeps recurring. And it's about this sense of precariousness, which I think lots of Irish people do feel about their place in the world. When I was looking at about how foreign correspondents looked at Ireland, what was really interesting was how much Ireland had become in during the time of the revolution, an international issue. It was, a, it was a mini Spain of its day. The big talking point about the current crisis over the last couple of months in Dublin has been an article in Vanity Fair magazine by Michael Lewis. As a friend of mine remarked, it didn't tell us an awful lot that we didn't know already, but everybody was talking about it. And it, it just occurred to me, here it is again, it's, it's a, a, a keen preoccupation to measure how we're doing about what people are saying about us. I just wanted to look a little across the last uh, 90 or so years of the independent Ireland. I don't think Ireland really ever developed um, what you might grandiosely call a theory of wealth. When Ireland was, um, became independent, uh, th the leaders of that movement really did think that once they achieved freedom, once they achieved an independent state, the economic question would look after itself. Their ideas uh, were very rudimentary. Um, the Irish independence happened at a very particular point, which is that the, the globalised world that um, Keynes described in uh, The Economic Consequence of the Peace, where a, a man in London could lie in bed sipping his tea and order up uh, anything and expect to have it delivered the next day and adventure his money in any part of the world. That globalised world was shattered by the First World War and that's the world in which this, this reduced world, this, this autarkic world, was the world that Ireland became independent in. They had ideas that Ireland, if, if, if Ireland was independent, Ireland could industrialise. Throughout the 20s, 30s, 40s, Ireland became um, this, this self-sufficient model, this De Valera's, De Valera's Ireland, the creator of De Valera's Ireland was import substitution, was behind a big tariff wall to build up Irish industry. And it was very clear by the 1950s that that had failed. And, and it was in the 1950s that you do see people <coughs> writing books and articles and asking, does Ireland have a future? And literally the country, uh, I think about half a million people emigrated between 1945 and 1965. The country was disappearing. Uh, and, and that, in a way, was an Ireland with no future. And that's the past, I think, that people are worried about going back to now. This was all changed in about 1950, in 1958, when uh, Sean Lamas, who'd been a revolutionary, uh, who'd been de Valera's right-hand man during the, all the era of the uh, self-sufficiency, Sean Lamas decided this couldn't stand anymore. Mm -hmm. And one of his civil servants, T.K. Whitaker, wrote a paper called The Programme of Economic Expansion, which was to open up Ireland to foreign investment. Mm -hmm. And so they began to do this, and Ireland did boom. It was around the 1960s, middle 1960s, that a new generation of politicians rose up in boom time Ireland, which, who turned out to be corrupt. And I was looking at a book about Le Mas. It's a very, very well-produced book by the Royal Irish Academy called Judging Le Mas by an Irish political scientist called Tom Garvin. Two interesting photographs caught my eye. Sean Le in 1965, drove across the border to Northern Ireland to meet Captain Terence O'Neill, who was then the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. And there were photographs of Le in Stormont in Belfast with Terence O'Neill. And Le is wearing a flecked coat, uh, an overcoat with flecks, woolen flecks. He was the son of a tailor and he was quite dapper. And then I remembered that there was another photo, and I, I went back in the book, and there was a photo of Le four years earlier, taken on his way to work in Dublin in the morning. <coughs> and there he was wearing the same overcoat. And in a way, this sartorial image, it, it, the, the new generation of um, on-the-make politicians that emerged in Ireland in the 1960s were known as the men in the mohair suits. And in some ways, this story about La Masse signified a change of, uh, in generation between a generation used to austerity uh, and uh, not used at all to uh, any kind of uh, gaining anything from public service to a no new generation who did. Now, that, that boom was destroyed, really, by the, as all of Western Europe's boom was destroyed by the, 
uh, our Israeli conflict in 1973. Ireland passed through in the late 70s and early 80s, a terrible time um, with where it, there was crushing debt. And then suddenly Ireland re-emerged uh, in uh, this extraordinary boom that became known as the Celtic Tiger in the 1990s. But I think what was missing from all of that was an idea of what some idea of what Ireland would do once it got wealthy. I think the, the main problem with Ireland, in terms of the economic question, is that we've had lots of discussions, or the main discussions that occupied uh, intellectuals and uh, not, not just economists, but people over the last 40 years have been about identity, about sovereignty, identity, our relationship to Northern Ireland, but no real sense I don't, of what Ireland would have done if it had wealth. And I think the, the most depressing or the most... Uh, uh, affecting uh, sense that you have visiting Ireland now about the boom is, is the sense that, some, that Ireland had achieved something, some position of, uh, of some idea of wealth, which <coughs> is gone and has been blown away and is gone for, for, for several, a generation or two now. The, the, the future for Ireland, uh, I, I think, is bleak, but also very narrow. But I think what, ha what this event, the crash of the last three years, may um, provoke, and indeed I think has to provoke, is some kind of better debate about what a wealthy Ireland will be, what kind of Ireland people want if it's a wealthy Ireland. I met somebody from Newfoundland, um, and um, they told me that in the year Ireland became an, an, a republic, Newfoundland was absorbed into Canada, and the reason it was absorbed is because it went bust. And I went and looked at some of the... Uh, the British government, it was a dominion, and the British government appointed a commission, a royal commission, to look at the problems of Newfoundland, and it identified reckless spending and a public, uh, a, a political system uh, which put personal uh, uh, aims ahead of national interests. In today's world, if, I, if you look at Ireland as New Newfoundland, in 1949, Britain was the bondholders and the, um, uh, the uh, European Union, and essentially Britain sold... Newfoundland uh, at, a, at a discount to Canada. Um, and I think that's what Ireland you know, could be potentially be looking at. And I think that's what people are, are worried about. I mean, how long will it take for Ireland to become a fully functioning and fully um, uh, sovereign <coughs> member of the European Union again? After independence and then into the Second World War and beyond, Ireland was preoccupied by questions of sovereignty, culture, language, and as you say in the forthcoming essay, it failed to develop, and I quote you, an idea of what a wealthy island should look like. So are you saying that it, it abandoned economics or didn't have a coherent sense of an economic policy? Well, I think if you look at, from, from the vantage point of a richer Ireland, if you look back to the 1950s, um, the, Tom Garvin wrote a very good book called Preventing the Future, in which he argued very convincingly that um, a sort of anti-materialism, uh, a sort of aesthetic, a sort of a, a religious and ethical sensibility prevented what he called sci scientific thinking. And so that for a long time, Ireland, mis after the Second World War, when the rest of Europe was, uh, was booming and prospering, Ireland was missing out because it didn't have a generation of civil servants, uh, policy makers, politicians who thought about that. And that suddenly Ar the reason Ireland became rich was that it did. But I think while that's all very convincing. I think the wheel maybe has turned a little bit now. While you could easily criticize De Valera's Ireland for the impoverishment of its thinking in terms of its dynam dynamism and thinking and the fact that by the late 50s, the population had reached its lowest level since census began. What would that have been? 2.8 million. 2 million. The key thing about the Celtic Tiger period was it was partly a series of good policies, but it was also partly a series of fortuitous circumstances. The biggest one being that Ireland hit a period when most of its population was w of working age was between 18 and 60, so it was neither a, a draw on the public coffers or also and also was a contributor in terms of everybody who was able to work. And there was other fortuitous circumstances as well. But I, I think that th all of this ethical thinking that was derided from the in the absence of any any practical economic plan in the 1940s and 50s, suddenly was deficient in 1990s and uh, in certainly in the last five, year, five or six years. Do you think Ireland differs from other European countries because in some ways it's been in thought to a, a kind of form of cronyism with the relationships between business and the political elite and, and perhaps the media elites? 
I, yeah, I, I don't want to overdo too much about how, you know, Irish exceptionalism either. The cronyism was there, it's partly, but it is partly a function of uh, a, a politics that didn't, partly a function of politics that didn't change from the Civil War, and only, only now is it beginning to change. What took you away from Ireland uh, uh, as a young man? I mean, there's a lot of ob obviously a lot of Irish people living in London and, and the continent of Europe and the U.S. There's a sense of is it is, was it a sense that Irish was Ireland was too small for your ambition? No, it was poverty and oppression. <laughs> but um, doesn't that come from this morning? No, no. I I left voluntarily in the 1980s. I mean, I left at a period in the mid 1980s when a lot of friends of mine were leaving because they couldn't find work and they wanted to go elsewhere. And a lot of these people came back to Ireland in the 1990s uh, and 2000s. I left voluntarily to go to Latin America because I wanted to, I wanted to be away. One of the things, you mentioned the Michael Lewis article in Vanity Fair and how it's been much talked about in Ireland itself. I thought there was a rather scornful attitude from Lewis about the Irish themselves. He quotes here, it was something he feels the Irish are unusually obsessed with their own Irishness. This is the Lewis um, interpretation of the Irish. He says their loud patriotism is a cargo ship for their doubt. Did you think there was something rather unfair about that, something scornful, something mocking, a sense of someone who doesn't really understand Irish history, the, uh, the, the long engagement? Again, I think it's interesting. Uh, I think the nature of that has changed as well. I think what people are right in saying that what the last 15 years has done in Ireland is make Ireland a much more self-confident place. It was interesting, he noticed when he went, he went to visit the Dáil, the Irish Parliament, and he noticed that people were speaking in Gaelic and English. And, English. and he found that quite a, a rather aggressive thing. And I, I was in there recently again for the first time in about 10 years, and I just didn't find it at all. I was, I was struck by how he found that so striking. If anything, um, I think that defensive sense of patriotism has changed entirely in Ireland now. I think. Do you think um, Fintan O'Toole was on the Today programme this morning, the Irish Times columnist and influential author, was talking about um, that the Irish banks could be facing their fifth bailout since September 2008? Is the only possibility now some kind of negotiated default? I don't see, I don't see any option, really. Um, and I think even during the election, the, sort of the assumption was that, that they would make willing with this plan for a year or two years. But I, mm. uh, ultimately, it doesn't seem at all possible that Irish taxpayers can mm. bear that burden. Um, and so I think, yes, some kind of managed default I, I don't see any, nothing suggests to me that that's not going to be an option down the line. What would that do to the kind of psychology of this proud nation for whom sovereignty has been so important? No, I think actually in, in terms of um, sovereignty, I think people who played the sovereignty card or who, who, are, who are fired up by sovereignty are more interested in defaulting um, than in Ireland becoming Mexico of 1982, mm -hmm. than in Ireland becoming a sort of um, protectorate of the EU and the IMF and kind of um, uh, just cutting its cloth according to its measure according to other people's dictates. During the um, election campaign, you were over there for the New Statesman, and you, you went out, I think, with one of the candidates, didn't you, in Dublin, um, for Fine Gael? Yeah. What were you picking up when you were knocking on, the do knocking on the doors and talking to the potential voters? It's interesting. I went to, live in a, I went to Canvas for a few hours in a very well-heeled part of Dublin, which near where I used to live when I was a student. And when I was a student in Dublin in the 80s, um, this part of Dublin... Uh, was occupied by students, uh, a lot of these houses. And I'd noticed, I hadn't walked around there for years, that a lot of these houses were no longer in student flats. Um, they'd been refurbished to a very high spec. Accounts of Ireland led me to expect anger on the doorsteps. There was no anger on the doorsteps. And I realized that there, were, there are people in Ireland who uh, bought their house in that part of Dublin in the mid 80s, late 80s, and haven't traded since, and certainly didn't trade at the height of the boom, who given, even given the 50, 60% fall in asset values are still rather comfortable and will ride out this storm. And I think it's, it's very much like the famine in Ireland, where there were people who emerged out of the Irish famine in the 18th, uh, middle of the 19th century who emerged stronger uh, and in a stronger and better position and prospered more because of it. Um, I think there are people who are going to emerge from this stronger. I think it's really going to hit people under the age of 30. I mean, I know that you know, I have two nieces who are in their late 20s. They tell me that five or six people from where they grew up all went off to Australia uh, a week or two ago. Because of unemployment? Yeah.